All right, so I am in the process of taking all of the Razorback off-road stuff off the car, which also entails all the bent up lighting uh, that resulted from our trip to Oregon. Um, gonna take it all off, gonna clean it up, gonna bend all the bent stuff back. And uh, yeah, here's the window. As you can see, it's uh, fully intact, nothing wrong with that. But uh, when we nosedived, pushed the front of the car back in a little bit. So as of right now, this is a pretty stiff hold on the hood here, but uh, it doesn't lay flush with the car. So I need to figure out what bent in the front fascia supports, bend it back so the hood lays flat again. So I was just pulling this mess apart so I can get it cleaned up, getting the, the lighting all taken apart and it's all hardwired and I didn't put any quick disconnects in the cage. So I gotta come down here and I need to clean all this mess up. It was done in a hurry, but I have the power bars. They're all there, everything's ready to go. I just, I just need to clean this all up. But anyways, this happened. I heard jingles and those bad boys fell out. I was like, what the heck? And uh, yeah, this is what happens when you buy Chinese parts as accessories for your light bars. Um, they tend to disintegrate. So as you can see, the switch post is there. That's what's happening when you're changing your switch on and off. And then that's rocking in the contacts here. And you can see where the poles come up and make contact. And then your, um, your, your contacts that flew out down here, they act like springs. And that's where you get your click and your clack. Um, but uh, if they're low grade Chinesium, they explode when you uh, take the dash off. So yeah, lesson learned. All right, I got the Razorback Off-Road kit off the Razor. I have the front fascia off the Razor. You can probably notice the Corbin Customs turn signal kit. Go check them out, CorbinCustomWorks.com. But the Razor is now faceless and I can kind of get perspective on why the hood won't fit uh, correctly. And just kind of a post-mortem uh, from our nosedive in Oregon. Um, you know, basically what's happened is this bracketing uh, got pushed back just a little bit. It's not perfectly straight anymore. So that'll easily get bent back. But the more important damage is that I had a horn kit right here. Let's see, where did the horn go? Here it is. I had a horn kit up in here and it got pushed into the radiator. Uh, it doesn't appear to have any leaks or anything, but I think that's something I'm gonna keep an eye on just in case. But what's happened is that you can see how the holes no longer align. The hole is over there. Um, and so this bracketing, I didn't realize this, this whole bracket for the radiator is floating. So you can see, if I remove this out of the way, it's, it's bolted here to the front uh, pillar on both sides. And then this bracket floats, the fan, the whole fan assembly sits in here in a rubber grommet. So that's not secure, it's floating. And then uh, you can see that your uh, foil, where's my foil? Here's my air dam foil. This secures up in there like that. This got bent, as you can see, I kind of forced it back while we were out there. I'll straighten that back out. But you can see that this bracket is no longer what I would call straight and is no longer lining up with the front plastics. So to pull that back out, you can see that you would then separate the intercooler from the front radiator and then uh, would realign the whole hood correctly. So unfortunately, that means taking more stuff off, but if I do that, I think we'll be back in action straight as an arrow, but we gotta get, we gotta get this stuff straightened back out. Well, 
I saw that, called that out, but I totally missed that. <laughs> uh, squishy, squishy. So we'll have to keep an eye on that one as well. Make sure that doesn't start leaking. I did get the brackets all nice and straightened out. So I, uh, you, can, you can take those out while the car is still together. It's just that one bolt in the back. And then, like I said, these are floating, so they just pull right out. But the brackets are straight. Those are gonna go back in. And then I got some wiring to clean up. All right, so one of the first things I'm doing is I'm putting in the Pro 8 uh, switch panel from Real Light Bars. Uh, this is a cool little unit that has eight um, solid state switches, but that connect to a serviceable um, relay and fuse system. So I'll show you more of that as we do it. I uh, look forward to that review. We then have the Mac 3.2 from Rugged Radios. This is their, um, I don't want to call it the first gen, but it's their latest gen before the one that just came out at Sandsport. So uh, this is a two place pumper, uh, has two spots uh, for helmets. You can see we got the two tubes. We also have the airspeed controller. So we'll go through that. Um, we have a amped off-road uh, full face helmet that comes with uh, the pumper attachment. So on the back of the helmet, there's some vents for that. I'll hook up the air system. We'll see what the uh, amperage draw is on that, um, both at free flow and at full load. So if we compress the uh, outputs on them, that'd be full load and see what the amperage draw is on that. All right, so I just unpacked the pumper system uh, that comes with the Mac 3.2 is your air filter. Uh, it has a little diagram on top saying to wash before use. Um, and it gives you some cleaning instructions on the back of that. Once you've gotten past that, you can see that they have a rugged branded topper, a nice uh, paper and mesh filter, uh, very open, lots of surface area, which is great. Um, and then you can see there's a nice little um, connection o-ring there, and they include the pipe uh, clamp. It also comes with a sock for your large debris, and a connection harness, and some mounting bolts for your a racket, which you need to get, which is this guy. Um, and then you can mount this anywhere on your machine and then mount the radios uh, or the uh, pumper onto that. So if you're not familiar with the pumper, this is a fresh air system for your helmet. So air comes through the filter into the pumper. The fan spins blowing air out the bottom. You can cap either one of these um, and have just one, but you can leave them open for both. Those go through the tubes into your helmet, providing fresh air from the top or the side. You get different styles of helmets. This one's gonna be on a top quarter. Um, you can also get a top center and you can also get a jaw. The differences between those is that the air coming down uh, will go across your visor and help eliminate fog from breathing. Uh, the air that comes in the mouth uh, along the jaw does not do that. So that's important to remember if you're selecting a helmet for a pumper setup, you're gonna to want to um, accommodate for that, as well as any height restraints. Like I'm a taller driver, I can't do a top center because there's just no height between my helmet and the roof. Uh, so I have to do either a top quarter or a jaw. And again, I want the air going across my visor, so I'm getting a top quarter. Um, the, the side jaw mounts, there's nothing wrong with them, it's just my preference. The Mac Air VSC, the variable speed controller, is this guy here. As you can see, uh, you have a speed controller, and then you also have um, your variable or full uh, switch. And we'll, we'll go over that in a little bit. But that goes down to a fuse. Uh, you have your in and out. Uh, they provide you the extension and a wiring harness for that, along with mounting screws to get this guy anywhere you want it in your Razor or X3 or wherever you're putting it. So anyways, this guy, you can see there's a very large uh, bearing fan inside uh, with um, some fairly aggressive thick blades uh, and then that pumps out through the bottom. So you can see uh, we're dealing with a 12 volt fan at 3.4 amps. So we'll, we'll plug it in and see if it actually runs at 3.4 volts or I'm sorry, amps. And then it's supposed to run at 18,850 RPM. So 18,000 RPM is pretty high, which means with these aggressive blades and being a bearing fan, this is probably going to be a slightly loud fan. 
Um, I'll have to take a measurement to see how loud it is next to the box, but more importantly, um, it's gonna be a matter of how loud it is in your helmet. All right, so we have the fan. Uh, we're gonna need to plug into that. I think the first thing we're gonna do is do a power test without the variable controller because the variable controller will introduce resistance um, as well as any um, some variable uh, on the on the power draw. So uh, let me strip these. Twist those up a little bit. So nice weather pack connectors. Uh, so moisture is not going to be a problem for that part of it. Um, obviously being a fan, you don't want to get the fan uh, submerged or in some, any kind of heavy duty moisture environment. So let's see, uh, let's see what the draw is just by itself with no cover, no filter, no pumps. Uh, this should be the least amount of resistance on the motor and thus the least amount of power draw. So we got a nice balanced 12 volts. So we should be able to see the amperage and the wattage, um, calculated on the front here. So let's see what happens. I think it can go without saying that uh, you should never put your fingers in the blender, um, so to speak. But uh, yeah, you can see how much how much air this thing was putting out, um, and you can see that it was around that 5.6 amp draw. So uh, we were looking um, on the fan here; it's at 3.4 amp um, at 12 volts. So obviously, it's quite a bit more of a draw than that. Uh, this is the original with the carbon fiber uh, shell um, and the original fan setup. Uh, they have a new version out that has a plastic body um, with a whole new fan on the inside. Um, and I think that the internals have better uh, airflow characteristics uh, and it's at like half the price point. So go check that one out, but this will give you a good reference for what's going on with this system. Uh, thanks to Rugged for hooking me up with this unit. Um, reached out to them and they supplied this unit uh, for this install and this review. So, so far I really like the build quality. Uh, we'll get into that more as we install it. Uh, we were looking at about 5.6 uh, amps straight through, no filter, no uh, resistance on the unit. Uh, let's get the, the filter on it and uh, see what happens when we um, put some resistance on, on the unit simply gets connected at either end. You'll see that they're identical and these rugged uh, pumper uh, tubes are extendable and flexible in all that angles and directions and all that. So you just kind of twist it on there like that. Twist it onto the pumper like that. And then for purposes of testing, uh, I'm going to install the second tube like that, put the filter back on, okay, and then what I'm going to do is use some gaff tape to cover this end temporarily while we test uh, the one output. So what this will do is it'll create load on the fan um, because one of them is not being used, um, and then also It'll create load on the fan because you now have the resistance of the helmet itself. Yeah, same setup, same plugged in, uh, going through the filter, through the pumper, into two tubes, one of them being capped off like you're not using it, and one of them going through a helmet. With no restrictions, we were at 5.6 amps, and with everything connected, So with full load, um, we were at just under six amps, so 5.9 amps. 
So this system with no uh, resistive controller on it was 5.9 amps. Um, this would be the most load you would have on the system uh, being capped on one and flowing into a helmet on the other. So let's introduce the variable controller and see what that does. Putting the controller in does introduce an inline fuse, which is nice. Um, I think we're gonna see like a 15 amp fuse. That's a 10 amp fuse. Um, and then it brings in a variable speed controller. And essentially this becomes a rheostat uh, for it. And then you have your variable fan speed um, and then full fan speed. So flip it up, you can turn the fan up and down. Uh, turn it uh, down to full. Uh, you'll have clean pass through, no resistance on the controller. Uh, just that. Basically, the idea being just like we had it before without the controller. We'll put it on full. So interestingly, uh, it only went to 5.4, uh, which means that the controller um, is actually reducing the output a, a slight bit. Let's see what it goes up to the variable and uh, where the range is from low to high. All right, so all the way down is nothing. Nothing's on. But we can see that we've introduced a amperage draw. So I'll turn it up slowly. Okay, so right about there, about nine o'clock on the controller is right where the fan kicked on. Um, there's a minimum load to which the fan will then introduce spin uh, based off the magnets. So we can see a minimum amperage draw of this complete system uh, will be 0.17 amps. And let's work our way up. Uh, at halfway, you're getting about that 1.7 uh, or 1.2 amp draw. Work our way up. All right, so what I saw was uh, on the controller, like we showed at the beginning, um, you didn't really get any engagement on the fan until about nine o'clock. And then uh, once we got to about four o'clock, uh, any movement past that didn't introduce any more uh, control. So basically your m range of movement is, is nine o'clock to three o'clock, four o'clock, um, but it's gonna give you most of what you need in this scenario for having um, a variable control pumper. So why is that important? You're going to have uh, times where you just want a little bit of airflow to clean off the visor of fog. Uh, there's going to be other times where you're doing a lot of breathing, like you're racing or something, uh, and you're going to want to crank that bad boy up and get as much airflow through there to, and also help pressurize your helmet to push air out and keep dust out of your helmet. Um, so lots of reasons why you'd want different variations of the setup. Um, but uh, so far, what we can see is that, that about five and a half amps ish uh, on the draw of this system.